Please welcome Dawn. Hi. So I was supposed to come here today to talk to everyone about accessibility. Unfortunately, before I got here, my talk got disabled, so I'm actually going to spend the next 45 minutes or so explaining to you how you would go about re-enabling it. If that doesn't make sense now, don't worry. It should make sense at the end of the 45 minutes. Uh, if you still have questions, you can ask them then. So, who am I? I have already been introduced, but here's the longer bio. Um, my name is Dawn. I work at MYOB. I am an accidental accessibility advocate, and in my spare time, I am also an occasional author and kitchen alchemist. Sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't. And a raging sports ball fan, which is why that picture up there is a picture of me at Marvel Stadium. Now, accidental accessibility advocate is kind of an interesting phrase. Uh, you might be wondering a bit about that, and I wouldn't blame you, because those are words that you wouldn't necessarily think about being strung together in a sentence. Accessibility advocate, sure, but where does the accidental come from? Well, typically from things like this. Perhaps not particularly useful when your accessible bathroom is up a set of stairs, particularly given that the universal wheelchair symbol does actually have something that symbolizes a wheel in it. So before we get into the meat of this talk, we should probably define a couple of terms. Um, first of all, disability, which is a continuing condition which restricts everyday activities. Uh, that's the legal definition that's used in Australia, the continuing being a condition that's expected to last for six months or more. Restricting everyday activities, I think, is fairly self-explanatory. And accessibility is not just a term about disability. Basically, in a nutshell, it's the degree to which a thing or activity or something can be done by everyone. So something could be accessible or inaccessible, but something might be accessible to blind people but not to deaf people. It might be accessible to white people but not to black people. It might be accessible to men but not to women. There are a lot of different ways that you can break down accessibility. And saying that something is accessible doesn't mean that it's accessible for everyone. It's a very nuanced term. Now, this is where we get political for a minute, so please forgive me. Um, there are briefly two ways that you consider, can consider disability. There's the medical model and the social model. The medical model effectively holds that disability is a problem. It's something to be cured. It's something to be solved. As you can see, we've got our doctor there comforting the patient in a wheelchair. On the other hand, the social model holds that it's not actually disability that's the problem. It's the fact that disability makes things inaccessible for people in that our society is not really designed for disabled people. So it's not disability then that's the problem, but accessibility. And when the social model goes well, you get things like this. We've got our wheelchair users here playing wheelchair sports who will look quite happy with that. And they're able to do that because we have adapted things to them. We've set it up so that rather than considering their disability a problem and something to cure, we've set it up so that they can get involved with things. We've adapted activities. We've made them accessible. And the medical model has its values. I wouldn't want to dismiss it entirely, but for the purposes of this talk, we're basically going to be talking about things in terms of the social model of disability. Let's define a couple more terms before we keep going. Accessible design is basically about building a world that everyone can navigate and use. And as I said before, that's not just about disability. If you have an AI that doesn't recognize black people's faces, that's not an especially accessible piece of design. And adaptive technology are tools that disabled people use to improve access. Now, that can be very low tech. This, my walking stick, is a piece of adaptive technology. Other pieces of adaptive technology might be alternative and augmentative communication that people who are unable to speak might use. Wheelchairs are a form of adaptive technology. So adaptive technology, there are a lot of different things that encompass that term, but it's something that when you're designing for accessibility, you're going to run into a lot. And if you're here, I feel pretty safe in saying that this is part of your job. 
Accessibility is something that we should do from the ground up. It's something that if you integrate the concept of accessible design into everything you do, then you don't have to worry then about the things that you build. But if you don't think about it, then people can't use what you built. And accessible design typically is good design. What do I mean by this? Namely that if you follow the principles of good design, then the things that you build are more likely than not to be accessible. The better your design principles are, the less work you're going to have to do to make the things that you design accessible to everyone. This is an example of bad design. This is arngren.net, and I didn't have to look very hard to find this. It's actually on quite a number of top 10 worst websites ever lists. We've got, as you can see, a lot of different colors, not particularly much structure, a bunch of pictures with not really much information about what they mean. Maybe it would make more sense if you spoke Norwegian, but it's still not really ideal in terms of the way that we design things. And unsurprisingly, uh, it's not accessible. You cannot get around it with keyboard navigation. It's very hard to get around if you're colorblind. There are a lot of issues with accessibility with this website that become very obvious because it's badly designed in the first place. And then there's distinctive design. This is Ling's cards. It may or may not surprise you to learn that this is actually one of the most successful car leasing businesses in the UK. And Ling, the titular owner, has very much built a brand around this distinctive website. Um, now, there's a lot of flashing text. That uh, tongue is animated. The stop sign is animated. Ling's face in the top left-hand corner is animated. And my favorite, which I couldn't actually get into the screenshot, is the uh, animated GIF of Boris Johnson just below the YouTube video describing the Boris Brexit guarantee. Now, Ling's cars is distinctive. It's built a brand. And it's accessible in some aspects, but not in others. A lot of the pictures do not have alt text, so someone tabbing around does not actually know what those pictures are if they can't see them. The menu is relatively accessible, but it's not great. It doesn't scale well. So there are a lot of issues with the site that you kind of have to consider that when you're building a distinctive brand, something that's a bit out of the norm, you may have to go to a little bit of extra trouble to make things accessible. Now, if we want to talk about good design, here's a website that probably everyone here uses on a fairly regular basis, and that is GitHub. Now, GitHub is not perfect. GitHub is not perfectly accessible, but GitHub is a very good baseline to look at in terms of accessibility. One of the things that they do that is really good for both accessibility and general design is that top bar, the four pieces of information there are not home contents help. It's pull requests, issues, marketplace, explore. And that's because if you're going around GitHub, those are probably going to be the four places that you're most commonly going to go to. It scales very well. It doesn't use color as a sole way to convey information anywhere. You can always, even with that color strip that tells you what language it is, you can mouse over and get a tooltip that will actually give you that in text. And this is actually the uh, repository for NVDA, which is a free open source screen reader for Windows. And the reason that they use GitHub is because it's really accessible to screen reader users if they want to submit a bug with the software or raise a new feature request. The users of NVDA and the creators of NVDA have worked out this is actually the most accessible way to do this. So that in and of itself kind of speaks to how good an example it, GitHub is of both good design and accessibility. If you want to do this, there are a lot of resources out there. The web content accessibility guidelines are kind of the baseline that everyone goes by. And the accessibility project built a an accessibility checklist off that, which is a simpler, easier to understand way that you can go through and work out, does your website actually meet these guidelines? And if we've got any DevOps people in the room, uh, that can actually be automated into your build pipelines. Um, the Axe Accessibility Checker is the one that I've used because it's one of the ones that's been around the longest. But there are a number of 
open source projects that will allow you to automate as much of the accessibility guidelines as possible. And you can even integrate them into your build pipeline and they will tell you when things that you're doing fail the web content accessibility guidelines checks. If you're looking at some more specific examples, colorblindness is one of the big ones because that's about 5% of the population have some form of colorblindness. And so you've got the web page filter, you've got the image filter. Um, the one that I really like is the Color Oracle desktop filter because that's a piece of software that you can install on your desktop and just select it and it will give you all of the different types of color blindness, including blue color blindness and monochrome vision, which are fairly uncommon. And if you want to test how accessible your site is with a screen reader, the Pacciello group put together a list of basic screen reader commands, which will allow you to install any of the commonly used screen readers, NVDA, JAWS, VoiceOver, there are a couple of others, and go through your website using those instructions, which is something that I absolutely recommend you do. Guidelines are great. Unfortunately, when we're dealing with accessibility, one of the issues is, is that guidelines don't actually tell the whole story. I mentioned the web content accessibility guidelines earlier. One of the things that really irritates me about them is that they don't cover all accessibility requirements, namely one that I actually need, minimum font size on a web page. They have recommendations about how big font should be, but, uh, and they say that it should be zoomed up. You should be able to zoom it up to 200 times, but if you're giving me a six point font and then telling me to zoom that up to 200 times, uh, 200 times six point is still pretty small. So you need to be wary of what if someone has accessibility requirements that the guidelines don't cover? What if different groups of people have clashing requirements? And vision impairments is a good uh, one to talk about here because some people with different vision impairments can have requirements for things that clash with each other. Um, some people with vision impairments need to use light modes. Some people with vision impairments need to use high contrast modes, which tend to be dark modes. And that can depend on if you have issues with the amount of light that your eyes let in. So sometimes you kind of have to be aware that there's a degree of customization that you might have to do to get things to work. What if you're overwriting someone's local accessibility settings? Uh, this happens depressingly frequently, that you'll look around and you'll see blog posts or comments or people have called call centers and said, hey, I've installed your software on my desktop and I use high contrast mode and your software's overwriting it. It won't let me actually see things in high contrast mode. So it's worth clicking around the accessibility requirements and checking to make sure that you're not actually overwriting anyone's settings. What if the guidelines are misleading? There are a couple of interesting cases for this, and one of them is the contrast requirement that you get in the web content accessibility guidelines. Because if you have a light blue button on a white background with black text, that's going to pass the guidelines, but it's still very, very difficult to see. On the other hand, if you put white text on your light blue button, that's going to fail the guidelines, but is going to be much easier to see. Someone actually did a study of this looking at light blue and light orange buttons with both colorblind and non-colorblind users and found that if those buttons were on a white background, despite the fact that they would fail the content checkers, it was actually better off to have white text because people usually couldn't see the black text. So you need to be aware of those kinds of edge cases when you're developing for this sort of thing. What if the guidelines priorities are wrong for your use case? Um, if you have a website with lots of deaf users and you're using something like the web content accessibility guidelines, which tends to be more focused towards keyboard users, screen readers, and blind users, that might not actually be the best use case. Um, so if you know that you're building a website that's going to cater to one particular type of disability, or you do focus testing and you discover that you've got a lot of users with one type of disability, it's worth going out and looking to see whether you can find a guideline that's actually specifically designed for those kinds of users. What if the guidelines only cover good, not better? I'm sure that just about everyone here has heard of the 80-20 principle, and the guidelines will cover 80% of the use cases that you come up against, but that other 20% are going to come through your call centers, they're going to come through people complaining in blog posts and on forums, and those are the 20% that you're going to have to put a lot of work into. So it's good to be aware that while the guidelines are a starting point, they're not actually going to tell you everything that you need to know. <laughs> 
So with all of that in mind, how does design go wrong? This is Atlassian Confluence. I'm fairly sure that most people here will have, yeah, there's a few laughs in the audience. I'm sure that most people here have heard of Confluence. Um, it's a piece of software for anyone who hasn't heard of it that allows you to set up documentation and share it around an organization. And this is a fairly standard view of what a Confluence space, which is like a group's documentation, will look like. And if you want to create a new space or a new document in that space, you go through, you look at this dialog, you click a button, you create a web page that looks something like this. Looks fine, right? Let's go back and have another look at that. Despite the fact that this web page was created in my space, and you can tell because my name's up there, the page itself was actually created by someone called Matthew Gregory. That's not me, that's my manager. And this is why, because when I try to create a page on my zoomed into 200 times screen, the create button's cut off the bottom of it. See that red circle? Oops. So you can kind of get around the pop-up. You can get to a point where you can go halfway through the process of actually creating the page, but when you want to create it, uh, that button's cut off the bottom of the screen, and I'm sure you can imagine the difficulty this causes if you want to create a page and you have to get someone else to do it for you every time because the buttons are disappearing. So how do we improve it? Um, make sure that UI elements are scrollable and that nothing is cut off the bottom of the screen. And some people and some websites do this even when they're not zoomed in, which kind of boggles my mind a little bit. But play around, zoom things in, zoom them out, have a look, make sure that you're not cutting everything off. And if you can have a pop-up that scrolls with a page or a pop-up that you can scroll from top to bottom, that's going to be the best way to do this. Test your pop-up windows for basic accessibility. Are you blocking out other UI elements? Can you actually close them? It, can they be navigated using adaptive technology? Can someone with a screen reader or using keyboard navigation get around the pop-up and actually manage to successfully close it? And ultimately, if you want to do this properly, um, either magnify your screen yourself or get users of magnified screens to test your application because this is one of the more common accessibility use cases that you're going to run into. I need a human screen reader. I wasn't the person that said that. Um, this was said by my friend's grandmother, who, due to disability, uh, degenerative um, genetic disease, uh, later on in life became blind and was fairly tech savvy, so she used a screen reader to navigate around the internet. Now, my friend's grandmother was a person of faith, and she used the Patheos website, which bills itself as hosting the conversation on faith, to keep in contact with her religious community. And when she started using it in late 2016, it looked something like this. Now, this is a snapshot from the Wayback Machine, and some of the design here is not ideal, but you'd be able to see fairly clearly there are tabs, um, it's relatively easy to navigate around it, the text is clear, there aren't too many clashing colours. So if you wanted to get around this with a screen reader, it wasn't perfect, but it was navigable. Then in late 2017, early 2018, Patheos went through redesign. And after the redesign, it looks like this. Now I can't actually show you the problems with this website because modern browsers, the ones that are the new, latest versions of Chrome, Firefox, and Safari that were released about six months ago, uh, think that the advertisements and the pop-up videos are so obnoxious that they block them on site. See that? Text down there, that's, that's the remnants of one of the advertisements that get blocked on site. I wasn't using an ad blocker when I took this screenshot. It just blocks it out. And that made my friend's grandmother feel something like this. Uh, she was pretty frustrated and she was not very happy because when you rely on websites to get around, keep in contact with communities, and you're not able to do that anymore, that's incredibly frustrating. Coles, the retailer, actually got sued at one point because a screen reader user couldn't place orders through their website. And they lost that case. And now, if you want to look at examples of accessibility, Coles is one of them because now they know they have to do it. <laughs> so, that's not great, is it? Oops, 
And one of the main issues with this website was the autoplaying videos, because if you're trying to navigate around a website with a screen reader, the sound on autoplaying videos will talk over it. Which means that when you're trying to tab around the website, if you can't actually hear what the tabs are telling you in terms of shutting up that video, you're going to be navigating around it for a very long time. And if you can't see, you're not going to know where the video is on the page, which makes it really hard to close it. And when they had the pop-up ads that were clipping over other elements and were not correctly placed in the DOM, that also made websites very, very hard to navigate because every second thing you'd pick up would be an advertisement. Now, there is a thing called reader mode. Safari has it. I believe that Chrome and Firefox now have it, where you can click a button which will, in Safari, is in your address bar, and that will bring up basically a version of the page that just has the text and pictures. Everything else is stripped out. And that's great, except that in order to do that, you need to properly format your HTML. So you need to make sure that the text is in div tags, in paragraph tags, so that it can be picked up. Unfortunately, the designers at Patheos didn't actually do this, so reader mode couldn't be used on the website either. So how do we improve it? Well, this should be obvious just as a good design principle, but let people decide whether they want to play videos instead of auto-playing them. I'm fairly sure that everyone here knows about the annoyance that auto-playing videos cause, and they're also an accessibility issue, which is just one more good reason not to do this. If you do have pop-up elements on your website, which is sometimes going to be unavoidable, you want to make it easy for users of screen readers to close them. And so that means having them placed in an area where they're unobtrusive and making sure that they're correctly placed in the DOM. So that if someone wants to get around a menu, they can do that without having to worry about the pop-ups. It's always a good idea to check to see whether reader mode works on your website. It, provided that you have Safari installed or one of the other browsers that has it, and I'm not giving a list because I can't remember what they are, you can just click that button, see if it works, see if the button appears on your website, and if it doesn't, there are instructions on the web for how you can set this up. And in terms of testing, put on a blindfold, cover your screen, get that list of commands up, and have a go at navigating your website yourself with a screen reader. I actually did this with someone at work who wanted to know how accessible their website was. It took me about 15 minutes to find the first accessibility issue. And after we'd gone through it for an hour, we discovered that a large amount of the text, which was contextual information that people needed to be able to use that particular page, was not being read out. And that's not necessarily a failure on people's part. It's just something you wouldn't actually know unless you try it yourself. Does anyone here remember GeoCities? Yeah. Smiles and nods, there are a few people in the audience who are old enough to remember GeoCities. For anyone who's not old enough to remember GeoCities, um, websites that were created with GeoCities tended to look something like this. Now, I don't actually know what any of this says because it's in Thai, but um, we've got the classic clashing colors, animated penguin, um, text that doesn't really go anywhere, all it's missing is a few dancing elements. Now, GeoCities is actually dead. It was owned by Yahoo, and they killed it off, I believe, in March of 2019. Unfortunately, there are still a few people out there from the GeoCities era who think that some of the um, quirkier elements of GeoCities design are a good thing to use in their corporate websites which is basically the equivalent of taking your fancy corporate website, we are very amazing and we will show you why, and putting a Nyan cat on it. I have a friend who has photosensitive epilepsy, and she had something of an encounter with one of these um, enterprising designers who works for a company that shall remain unnamed. He had decided that in order to spruce up their corporate website, he was going to redesign the homepage. And as part of that redesign, he turned about two thirds of the homepage into a giant strobing pink element. My friend who has photosensitive epilepsy heard about the company, went to check it out and had a seizure, which resulted in a phone call that I think the designer probably didn't want to have. <laughs> Oops. The thing about photosensitive epilepsy is that if you've ever seen old video games and some new video games that have a warning on the back of them that says this game contains flashing and strobing effects, please be aware of it if you're sensitive to that, that's generally for the benefit of people with photosensitive epilepsy because flashing, flickering and strobing effects are a major cause of seizures. 
Now, photosensitive epilepsy itself is a spectrum from mild to severe. So my friend, obviously, being on the more severe end of the spectrum, does run into these issues more frequently than she would like. But in this case, because the giant strobing element was saturated pink, which is one of the most likely colours to trigger seizures, um, perhaps that could have been designed a bit better. So how do we improve it? Well, the obvious thing here is if you can possibly avoid it, don't use flashing, flickering, strobing type effects on your websites. Um, even for people who don't have photosensitive epilepsy, there are a lot of people that are sensitive to this, so it's generally better not to do it if you can avoid it. If you do need to, you want to make sure that they're low contrast. So if you have, say, a dark green and a dark blue, where there's not a lot of contrast between those two colours, um, that's going to be a lot better for someone with photosensitive epilepsy than flashing between bright red and white, or flashing between bright red and bright green. And try and limit the size. So don't do the thing of, let's have a top banner that's, you know, bright pink and strobing. Um, that's where you're going to run into a lot of those issues. And don't use saturated reds and pinks if you can. Even if it's your brand colors, you can probably tone it down a bit, a little bit. You can use alternative brand colors. You can use slightly lighter versions of the colors, which will help a little bit. And if you need to, and you want to do this very well, you can give people the option to disable flashing effects and animations on your website entirely. And that's not just beneficial for people with photosensitive epilepsy, that can also save everyone else time. Now, there is actually a reasonable amount of precedent for disabled people being involved in integrated sports. Reto Ildiko, um, the Hungarian fencer, won several medals at the Olympics. Um, Whitley Loper, the American trap shooter, also competed in the Olympics. And more recently, Shaquem Griffin um, went through college football and now competes in the American NFL, the National Football League, for the Seattle Seahawks. There are also more modern versions of sports, and I'm sure that some of the people in the audience would have heard about eSports, which is what this case study is about, specifically League of Legends. Now, League of Legends, for those who aren't aware of it, is basically a team game where you have teams of five people who aim to defeat the other team. And people can pick different champions with different abilities. And one of those champions is Tom Kench, the titular catfish. Now, when he was first introduced, he had a mechanic that no other characters in this game had, which was called Grey Health. And this is where we find out how many colorblind people are in the audience tonight. Because anyone who's not colorblind will be able to see that to the right-hand side of those bars, there's a little area that's kind of very light red and very light green. Now, the rest of that bar is grey health, which basically indicates that this character is currently unkillable. But if you run a colourblind filter over that, that's not so clear. And unfortunately for Riot Games, the creator of League of Legends, um, that resulted in this tweet from a professional player. If you didn't know, I'm colorblind, along with two other members of my team. All three of us can't see what health he's at in colorblind mode. He, of course, here being Tom Ketch. Uh, what this meant was that they never knew whether the opposing player was about to die or not, which made it very difficult to actually play the game and do their job. Oops. Color blindness is actually one of the more common things that you'll run into when you're dealing with accessibility, because about 5% of the population, mostly men, are colorblind. And most colorblind people can't tell the difference between red and green. If you can't see a color, it will generally look gray or black, as you saw in the previous slide. Um, there are also other forms of color blindness. You can be blue colorblind, and you can have no color vision at all. But generally, the most common use cases are red and green, which is not great when we indicate good with green and bad with red. But colorblind people will use contrast to tell the difference between colors they can't see. So if you have a very dark green and a very bright red, they're going to be able to tell the difference between that. But one of the issues with the previous slide was that the saturation of the red was about the same as the saturation of the gray, which meant that if you were colorblind, you just couldn't tell the difference. 
Now, some people will use icons to indicate information without using only color, and that's good. But if you're going to do that, you should make sure that the icons are unambiguous. I have actually seen a colorblind mode where the three icons were a square, a rounded rectangle, and a circle, which is not as good as if you had, say, a heart, a star, and a lightning bolt, which would clearly indicate what those things are doing. So how do we improve it? Well, First of all, use a contrast checker to ensure that elements will be viewable. And again, that doesn't just help colorblind people, that helps a whole lot of other people as well. And if you do have a colorblind mode for your website, you want to try and put colorblindness filters over it beforehand. They're not going to be perfect, but they'll give you some idea of what it will look like from the perspective of a colorblind person. Even better, if you've got colorblind people in your office, in your testing pool, get them to come over and test it. This is also something that I have recommended that people do. And when you develop software, if you're going to have colorblind modes, it's worth having modes for blue color blindness and achromatopsia, which is for people with no color vision at all. Slack does this really well. Um, if you go into Slack's preferences and accessibility settings, they actually have specific themes that are designed for protonopia and deuteranopia, which are red-green color blindness, but also for tritonopia, which is blue color blindness. Very uncommon, but I know someone who has it. And as I said before, if you're going to use icons, make sure that you use meaningful icons to indicate different elements and states. A good place that you can apply that is if you have login forms, check to see whether if you enter information incorrectly into the login form, it just goes red, or does it give you a cross to tell you that that information is invalid? Hacking an artificial pancreas. That's a sentence that has two meanings, because we could be talking about hacking together an artificial pancreas, or we could be talking about hacking into an artificial pancreas. Diabetics, in more recent years, have started to use something called an insulin pump. Basically, what you can do with an insulin pump is you hook it up, and then rather than having to inject yourself with insulin regularly, it will do all of that for you. It manages it for you. It makes things a lot easier. And this here is a mini-med insulin pump, which is made by Medtronic, who are one of the biggest medical device manufacturers for diabetic medical equipment in the world. Now, this line of mini-med insulin pumps had a really interesting security flaw. And the effect of that was that a number of diabetics started hunting them down to hack together an artificial pancreas. Because another recent invention is the constant blood glucose monitor, which is placed about a centimeter below the skin and releases information through Bluetooth connection. Now, what some enterprising people worked out is that because these mini-med insulin pumps had a security flaw, which would allow you to hook them up to any common radio frequency, you could hook them up to your blood glucose monitor and you could effectively hack an artificial pancreas so when your blood glucose dropped, the insulin pump would release insulin for you. Now that's really clever. The problem with that is that if something is discoverable on all common radio frequencies, um, it's also going to be somewhat vulnerable to hacker attacks. And that resulted in headlines like this because when the FDA issued their new alert on Medtronic insulin pump security, they just discovered that not only could you hack into these insulin pumps with phones, you could also hack into them with basically all TV remotes. <laughs> not ideal. Um, this happened, uh, people didn't take too much notice for a while, and then a few hackers decided that the FDA, the uh, US regulator, wasn't really taking this very seriously. And so they made an Android app that you could use to hook into these insulin pumps and deliver a lethal dose of insulin to anyone in your immediate vicinity. Not great. Which then resulted in Medtronic recalling the vulnerable Minimed insulin pumps. Oh dear. And this is why accessibility is not just about good design, because security on medical devices can be an accessibility issue. And if you've got people's health data, you're going to have to comply with regulation. It's really important that you make sure that medical devices are secure. It's somewhat compounded by the fact that if you're regulated by an external organization like the FDA in the US, they may not actually tell you about these issues quickly. 
or tell you about them at all. Um, it took quite a bit of pressure for the FDA to actually convince Medtronic to recall these insulin pumps, but you may not get that information through your regulator. Maybe something that you need to be on the lookout for constantly. And it's fairly important because if you're making medical devices, you hold people's lives in your hands. I did not think that I would ever be giving a talk where I would be talking about people creating an app that you could use to kill people, but here I am. So how do we improve it? Well, I guess you just do good security in general in that you want to consider the possible attack vectors. And if you possibly can, have people come in and conduct penetration testing before your device goes to market. Because generally, any pen testers that you have come in will have a fairly good idea of the security landscape. They're going to know where your vulnerabilities are more likely than you are. So you do want to have external people come in when you're devising medical devices, have them conduct pen testing. If people do raise security vulnerabilities, make sure that you respond promptly. Um, Medtronic, if they'd been keeping their fingers on the pulse of the news, would have actually known that they had the security vulnerability when people started buying up these insulin pumps to hack together artificial pancreases. And the really sad bit about this is that unintended uses can actually be a business opportunity. Because if Medtronic had seen those headlines and had seen people talking about this and had gone, hey, that's great, maybe not everyone can hack this together, but we're going to create a device that will do this for you, it would have sold like hotcakes and it would have opened up that sort of functionality to people who might not have been tech savvy enough to do it themselves. Medtronic are working on such a device. Um, as of the time of speaking, it has not yet come out. Uh, it's been about five years, and I imagine that if they had been able to do it before now, there would have been a huge market for it. Now, I've been giving this talk for about six months, and as a result of doing this, I became a lot more interested in accessibility as a topic in general. Um, one of the ways that I kept my finger on the pulse in terms of what was going on with accessibility was through my LinkedIn feed. And one day, a post from someone popped up suggesting that I should come along to a venue and hear an accessibility consultant give a talk about accessibility. I thought, great, cool. I know some things about accessibility, but I can't know everything and I'm always willing to learn. So let's go along and hear what this person has to say. So I left work at 4.30 and took myself along arrived at the venue to see this. Now, I would hope that it would generally strike people um, fairly quickly why having a set of stairs up to a venue where you're giving an accessibility talk is not ideal. The kicker was that that wasn't the only set of stairs. There were actually three flights of stairs to get up to the lift that would then take you to level one. And no, there wasn't an accessible entrance. I checked which makes you feel, if you're like me, or if you're in a wheelchair, something like Claptrap here who gets around with a wheel and can't actually get upstairs. Or, as I coined after this, um, like a Roomba that basically spends all its time shouting error 406, which for people who are not versed in HTML error codes means not acceptable. Now, the best bit about this was that wasn't the only accessibility issue that they had. Um, I went to go and find, after staggering up the stairs, a set of accessible bathrooms, or indeed bathrooms at all. And I discovered that not only were there no bathroom, no accessible bathrooms in the building, the only bathrooms that were in the building were down the fire escape, which was another three flights of stairs. I don't really think that I need to explain the irony here. So how do we improve it? Well, make sure that your venues are wheelchair accessible and have disabled bathrooms. Um, if your venues are not wheelchair accessible and do not have disabled bathrooms, people will not show up to them. So if you're organizing a meetup, um, it's something worth considering. How, if we had a wheelchair user want to come or we had a disabled person want to come, how would we let them in? If you want to go a bit more complex and cater to some invisible disabilities, um, you can look at providing things like quiet spaces and make sure that you provide adaptive technology. Uh, people with hearing aids will generally tend to use hearing loops at places like train stations and other theater venues. Um, if you have a hearing loop, make sure that you get your head around the technology and you can hook it up. 
I actually have a friend who uses hearing aids and did not know that hearing loops were a thing and discovered that hearing loops were a thing and called me one day and she was very pleased because she could suddenly hear the announcements at the train station after five years. If you're going to have discussions about accessibility, you probably want to include people with disabilities in those discussions because those discussions are for us, but they're often not had with us. And a good litmus test is to ask yourself, who's not in the room and why aren't they here? If everyone in the room has the same skin colour, why is that? If we have no disabled people in the room, why is that? Are there things that we could be doing to make it more inclusive? Have we set up barriers that we could pull down? Those are kind of questions that you want to be asking yourselves all the time when you're having these discussions. So, to recap. Accessibility benefits everyone, not just disabled people, and that's partly because a lot of accessibility is good design principles. Obviously, there's more work that you have to do there, but using good design principles will kind of start you on the journey to making things accessible. One quote that someone gave me while I was in the process of doing this that I really liked was that screen readers are great if you're blind, but they're also great if you've got two toddlers and you just want to be able to read a book. And a lot of the technology and advances that we come up with for accessibility tend to get used in a lot of other places as well that may not be obvious. And although a lot of accessibility issues will be about design, other issues like security risks can also be accessibility issues if they're not addressed properly. Thorough testing is important, and part of thorough testing is thinking about the things that disabled people might need to do differently. Obviously, I have trouble getting upstairs. Other disabled people may not be able to hear properly. They may not be able to see properly. People may have learning disabilities. They may have cognitive disabilities. There are many types of disability. And when you start querying those assumptions about what do people need, that's going to be something that's very important in terms of thorough testing. And if you can, the best thing to do is always to get adaptive technology users to test your software. If you can get people who use zoomed in screens, people who use screen readers on a day-to-day -day basis, they're going to have a much better idea of how to navigate that technology than your QAs are. And most importantly, listen to your users. If someone comes to you with an accessibility complaint and says, this is not accessible, what can we do to make it accessible? It's going to be much better if you say, hey, thanks for bringing this to our attention, let's see what we can do about it, than, well, we've followed the guidelines and that's all we're really interested in doing because the guidelines have told us everything we need to know. So listening is generally paramount. There are a few thanks due um, to Melissa Orr, who created the fancy corporate website for me, um, to Matt, my manager, who produced all of the screenshots of Atlassian Confluence, and to my friend Annie of Travelling Cat Studios, who drew up the fantastic accessibility room bar picture for me. Well, we've reached the end of the 45 minutes. Um, if anyone has questions, now is the time. Can we give you a round of applause? Sure. <laughs> Um, I've recently been trying to understand some accessibility stuff building a desktop application and using a Mac I tried to actually use this, the what's called a voiceover to see how a computer works and I felt completely clueless how anybody actually managed to achieve something using this technology. What I'm curious about is what resources I can find to find out how people normally use a screen reader and how I can use it myself so I can then do the blindfolded trick and try and use my computer to try and understand how to make the app better. So when I did this with the QA at work, um, what I did was I actually turned off the screen brightness and I brought up that list of developer, the list of screen reader commands that was on the slides, which the slides will be distributed. And I talked her through, this is how you use it, and we tabbed through the website. If you can as well, See if you can reach out to organisations like Vision Australia or see if people know people who use this software in their day-to-day -day lives and get those people in, pay them for their time, treat them as a resource and learn whatever you can from them. <laughs>
that, like, there's a lot of stuff on the internet and you can learn it to a degree, but there's no substitute, even me, and I have a reasonable understanding of accessibility because I talk to a lot of other disabled people as well. Even I'm not a substitute for someone who uses that software day to day. And if you want to really learn about it, you need to learn from those people. Other questions? Thank you very much, Dawn. Cool. If there are...